Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mark Dirks, and on behalf of ACRL and Choice, I'd like to welcome you to today's program, Documents That Change the Way We Live, which is sponsored by Roman and Littlefield. Today's discussion is one in a series of sponsored webinars from ACRL and Choice that addresses new ideas, developments, and products of interest to the academic library community. Free to users, these structured 60-minute live presentations provide the opportunity for interactive discussions of important new issues and developments in academic librarianship by librarians, vendors, authors, and other interested stakeholders. Before we get started, I'd like to point out a few features of the webinar software. In the main area of the screen, you can follow along with the presentation materials. Along the right-hand side, you will see a Q&A panel and a chat panel. If you don't, you can click the buttons labeled Chat and Q&A in the upper right corner of the screen to activate the panel. Please use the Q&A panel to submit questions to Joe at the end of the presentation. Uh, he'll take a few minutes to answer your questions, so please do send them in throughout. If you experience any technical issues, please use the chat panel uh, to let me know, and I'll troubleshoot the issue with you privately. Today, we're using the hashtag ACRLChoiceWebinars during the event, so if you have another screen handy, shout out to us. We're at choice underscore reviews on Twitter. I would also mention that uh, at, if you are interested in Joe's book, Documents That Change the Way We Live, at the Roman and Littlefield store at roman.com, you can receive 30% off the cover price using the uh, promo code Joe James. That's J-O-E-J-A-N-E-S. And also, please note that we are recording today's program, and everyone who registered will receive a follow-up email with a link to the archived version. So our presenter today is, as I've mentioned, Joe James. Joe is a frequent speaker in the U.S. and abroad. He is the author of several books, including Documents That Change the Way We Live and Library 2020. He has written a monthly column for American Libraries Magazine since 2002. He holds an MLS and a PhD from Syracuse University and has taught at the University of Michigan, the University of Toronto, the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, the State University of New York at Albany, as well as at uh, Syracuse and Washington. So with that, we are ready to get started. So I will turn the floor over to you, Joe. Uh, well, good morning, everybody, or at least good morning for those of us out here on the West Coast. Um, I'm delighted to be here. I want to thank uh, the folks at ACRL and Choice. I want to thank um, uh, uh, Mark for all his help in getting this started and all the folks at uh, Roman and Littlefield for sponsoring this. Uh, do please, as we, um, as we get going, do please feel free to submit uh, questions and uh, we'll have some time for that um, uh, at the end. I'm, I'm going to reserve a few minutes to to answer some of your questions at the end. Uh, Mark, are, are people seeing my slides? I don't think they are yet, Joe. Um, okay. I think if you hop over to the quick start and share um, your slide deck. Oops. Uh, I have lost, uh, I have lost, ah, I need to do that, and then that, there we go. and then that, and then that, and then that. And then that. How's that? <laughs> Beautiful. It's amazing what technology can do when you actually pay attention and do what you're supposed to do. So all the thanks are out of the way. Um, so if you're going to spend uh, time talking about documents, you should at least establish your credentials. And uh, when I say I know about documents, I know about documents. This, this is what I'm looking at right now. Um, this is not today. This picture was taken a while. That, that banana has long since gone to meet its maker. Um, but uh, the, imagine a 360 degree view of that. I looked at the name of participants. Some of you have experienced this firsthand. Um, I, I live in a sea of documents. I swim in them every day. So I, I kind of know what I'm talking about. And I, uh, I, I want to spend the time today telling some stories. Um, I am by nature nothing else if not a storyteller. And I want to tell stories that illustrate really important aspects of documents and their forms and genres and the roles they play, and in some cases getting really specific. But ultimately wanna, what I want to do is uh, um, help you to understand how these things connect to some of the most basic elements of the human experience. And where better to start in exploring the human condition 
than with this. Uh, the, so this is a sample Seattle City Light Bill. The, this is, when you say document to most people, and by that I mean not necessarily library and information professionals, this is what they think of, is they think of boring, dull, mundane stuff like this. Um, so I, when you say document to us, uh, you know, librarians and information folks and so on, we're quite comfortable with an expanded notion of document. Um, and I'm going to explore that as we go. But most of them are frankly pretty dull. Some of them, though, are more personally meaningful, more personally important. Um, to all of you, that's a lovely mid-century wedding picture. Um, to me, that's my mom and dad. That's my mom and dad's wedding picture. And uh, other than, you know, giving a plug for a mom and dad, uh, to whom I owe a great deal. Um, it also illustrates that um, when we say document, it isn't necessarily exclusively textual. It can, it can include images, it can include in sound, it can include uh, moving images, it can include things of other formats. So uh, that's always good to have in the back of our minds. But lots of them are really every day, or at least mundane. Now, here's one that I haven't used in a very long time other than talking about documents. Uh, so that's a, 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 an official copy of my birth certificate, minus the seal, so you can't actually use this. Um, most documents document things, record things. They do some work. They fulfill some personal or institutional or social need. And, and that's why these things arise. When you think of all the things that are in your wallet, when you think of all the things in your safe deposit box or that you have at home, those things are meant to do something. Um, they're meant to document or, or record or do some sort of work. Now, nobody gives a dang about my birth certificate, with the possible exception of me. Um, but some get a little more attention. So here's a birth certificate you may actually have seen or at the very least have heard about. This is a very ordinary birth certificate until it wasn't. Um, issued by the State of Hawaii Department of Health in 1961. Um, for a newborn child in Honolulu. Um, and then years later, it became famous around the world. In fact, I have a serving platter, um, the, which somebody thought was funny, um, of, uh, with the image of this birth certificate on it. Um, identity documents, things like this, and passports, and driver's licenses, and certificates of naturalization and so on, can make a huge difference, and as can documents of all kinds. Now, it doesn't have to get that famous to actually make a huge difference, but uh, for most people in most situations, these things have, these are among, identity documents like this are among the most familiar. And in fact, how many times in the last, you know, couple, three weeks have you heard the word undocumented? Uh, which means that for some people, all the pieces don't necessarily fit into place, and it's the pieces of paper that can actually guide and structure what you can and can't do in society, because we have built a society around those documents and the need for those documents to demonstrate something. Um, there are lots of examples of otherwise really mundane documents that got famous fast. That in the lower right-hand corner there is, is Alfred Nobel's handwritten will. Um, and you see that it's a mess. It's written, uh, I mean, the hand is beautiful, but it's written on the sides. This is actually four pages. It's a page folded over. So if you look on the reverse of this, you'd see exactly the same sort of thing. This should never have worked. It was badly formed. He never actually established the Nobel Foundation other than in the will. His executors had no idea that there was such a thing as a Nobel Foundation. There's all kinds of stories about them spiriting his money out of France because they thought it was going to be um, held back for taxes and so on. Um, so here's a perfectly ordinary will um, that wound up uh, establishing the Nobel Prizes, which are going to be announced in a few weeks, which, you know, in a lot of ways help to denote what, what some of the great achievements of the, humans, uh, the human species are. Um, a document doesn't have to be famous to be impactful. Here's one you've probably never seen or even heard of. This is Catherine Brewer's diploma from the Georgia Female College in 1840. And so far as I can find, this is the first diploma ever issued to a woman anywhere. Uh, women were not um, uh, welcomed at Oxford, Cambridge, Harvard, Yale, places like that. But the Georgia Female College, Catherine Brewer was one of the first uh, 
uh, female students at the Georgia Female College. Uh, she gets the first diploma because she was first in alphabetical order in her graduating class in 1840. That's in their, it's now Wesleyan College, that's in their archives. Um, and, and this just tells us about and, you know, how we, how we have evolved. Um, uh, some of them are much grander. Here's, this is the actual text. This is the actual document of the 19th Amendment. Um, you can see on the left-hand side that it's signed on the back. Um, this is in the National Archives. This is the original uh, joint resolution of Congress that was then, copies were sent to the states for ratification, finally ratified in 1920. Uh, this actual document is 1919. So some are much grander. Some are even grander still. Uh, you may have heard about this in the last few weeks, the 40th anniversary of the launch of the Voyager probes, um, uh, which if you've seen the first Star Trek movie, we actually know what happens to them. But these were meant to, uh, these were attached to the side of the Voyager probes, um, which were launched 40 years ago this month, primarily to explore the outer planets. But then now, the Voyager probes are the furthest objects of human construction. Um, and Voyager 1, in fact, has, le has passed the heliopause, has left the solar system. Um, it's entirely possible um, these are the only artifacts that will survive human civilization. Um, it's highly unlikely they will ever be damaged. It's even less likely, probably, that they'll be intercepted or even understood. But on, the, on these records, they are long playing records, and for those of us old enough to remember these things, they're at 16 and two-thirds RPM, because that meant you could get twice as much stuff um, as a 33 RPM. On there is music, there are pictures, there are greetings from Jimmy Carter and, unfortunately, Kurt Waldheim. It's before anybody knew. Um, so this document is a lot of things. It's a letter of introduction, it's an instruction manual, it's a map, it's an invitation, it's a family album, it's a scrapbook. Um, it's probably best described as a message in a bottle, um, uh, trying to uh, reach out to whoever might be out there to explain who we are and what we are and what we were and, and what we meant and the stories that we have to tell. Um, many, uh, many things that you think you know are considerably more involved and considerably more layered and more interesting than you think. This is a very familiar image. Um, uh, you see this thing on uh, posters, you, uh, reproductions of this poster. You see it on coffee mugs. It was a postage stamp. You see it on T-shirts. It, it has been adopted and co-opted and used and reused in all kinds of settings. We all know her. She's Rosie the Riveter. She's calling women to work in the factories during World War II as the men have gone off to war. And every aspect of that is completely wrong. She is not Rosie the Riveter. That's one version of Rosie the Riveter. That's the sheet music of the song from 1943. The poster is for, uh, from 1942. Excuse me. The poster is 1943. This was um, uh, uh, put up in Westinghouse factories in Pittsburgh, in and near Pittsburgh, for two weeks. You can't see it on the resolution on this slide, but the lower left of the poster, uh, to the left of, of the figure under the signature, that's the, if you get a good resolution copy of this, you can see those are the dates that the poster was meant to be put up in February of 1943. This was put up by the Westinghouse company by effectively their in-house propaganda arm. And it was meant to motivate people to work. These were very common in wartime factories. Uh, the late 30s were a period of tremendous labor unrest. Um, and then the war begins, and most companies form these information committees, which are effectively propaganda committees. Um, and they put up posters. She's a fairly benign example. There's a great one that encourages people to take shorter bathroom breaks. And the slogan on it is, killing time is killing men which gives you an idea of what the temperature was like. So this figure, this image of this woman in the headscarf rolling up her sleeves to get to work is not recruiting women to work in the factories. It's telling people who are already in the factories to get to work. Um, it's a motivational and even threatening image. She was taken down in 1943, put away, and then not seen again for decades. And it isn't entirely clear how she reemerges. She winds up in an article in the Washington Post, then winds up on the cover of Smithsonian Magazine in the 90s, and then the, po the, then the postage stamp and the T-shirts and everything else. So this is a great example of how this has been repurposed and reused and re-envisioned 
she's not Rosie the Riveter, but she is. And everybody thinks she is. And everybody acts like she is. And that's fine. I, I have no issue with the image. But the real story is actually far more interesting. And as, and so far as we know, unknown. How this image resurfaced. Who dug her out of what archive somewhere and made her famous. Um, and famous now, stand, she also now symbolizes a way of life in what we think of as um, home front wartime America that didn't really exist or didn't exist in the way that we all kind of half remember it. So the, there's far more to this story um, than meets the eye. There's all kinds of examples, unusual, should we say, and exotic examples of these things that, um, that tell us something about the way documents are used and what they do and how they work. You, you've heard the expression, read the riot act to somebody. That's the riot act. And you had to read that out loud. This is 1714. Um, this is a period of great unrest in Britain, England at the time. And uh, uh, Parliament passes the Riot Act, and this is the Riot Act. And so the sheriff, if he sees a riot, which is 12 people, um, he has to read that all out loud. And if you don't read the whole thing, uh, it doesn't work. Court decisions said you had to read all all of these words, including God save the king at the bottom, or it didn't count. If you were a riot and you were declared a riot by the sheriff when he read this at you, if you were a riot and didn't disperse when this was read at you, that was a felony punishable by death. So this was serious business. But if you didn't read all the words, it didn't work. So this isn't an oral document. It is written down and it was passed in the, in the Parliament of Great Britain. But it it's the speaking it that makes it work. So it, it bears resemblance to things like testimony or a ceremonial oath uh, or even a magic spell. If you don't say all the words, it doesn't work. Um, and, and so it's, it's a fascinating example of how a document can take multiple forms and, and how it works differently. You can't just wave this at people. You have to read it to them. Sometimes, a document can be important because of what's missing. Uh, those of us of a certain age remember Rosemary Woods. That is Rosemary Woods. She was Richard Nixon's secretary. And she here is demonstrating what became known as the Rosemary Stretch. You see her foot um, is on a pedal um, for a recording device that's next to her typewriter. I mean, if you're geeking out on old technology, here it is. And she's demonstrating that she was holding down the pedal while she reached for the phone, and that might have been how she erased a few minutes of one of the tapes um, from, in this case, the executive office building of a conversation between Nixon and Haldeman. Um, that, that doesn't explain the whole story. Uh, the, the forensic audio engineering report that was filed became uh, in, to investigate the 18 and a half minute gap, uh, which is a series of buzzes. Uh, they were never able to determine how it was done. They knew kind of the, the superficial notions of it, but they never knew how it was done. They certainly never figured out who did it. They know there was human speech underneath, but they don't know what it was. That became the textbook for forensic audio engineering investigations to this day. Um, the, this tape, this, this particular conversation, is not particularly interesting. I've listened to the whole thing. It's not the smoking gun tape from three days later where Nixon out loud says that he was the one who directed the, or at least was aware of the Watergate break-in. Um, so the, the importance, though, of the 18 and a half minute gap when this was revealed in, uh, in 1973 um, was that it documented a void. It docu and it became an emblem of mistrust. The fact that there was something missing from this tape was yet another straw on the camel's back of a lack of confidence in the president and the government and questions about the functioning of the Constitution. So this, this is a void. This is a, a gap that uh, became an important source of documentation, an important document. Documents don't even have to exist to work. Um, Joseph McCarthy gives a talk to the Ladies Club, of, the Ladies Republican Club of Wheeling, West Virginia in February of 1950 for uh, Abraham Lincoln Day. And he says he was going to give one of two speeches, either about housing or about communism. And he gives the communism speech. And he says, I have in my hand a list of 
205, a number he apparently made up uh, or got wrong from a staff report, uh, communists in the State Department, and off he went. He was nobody. He was um, uh, uh, who later referred to as the junior senator from Wisconsin and had what I like to think of as a complicated relationship with the truth, but it didn't matter. He had, he had the stage, and people were ready to make this work. There was never a list. He never produced a list. He kept changing the number of people who was on the list. First it was 205, then it was 57, then it was 81, then it was 10. There was never a list. He introduced the speech into the congressional record. There was no list appended to it, and yet it worked. The House Un-American Activities Committee was already at work, had been for over a decade, but kicked into high gear. This kicks off the blacklist. This kicks off the purge of suspected communists in, in um, entertainment and other, other industries and businesses around the country. Hundreds of people go to jail as a result of this. Thousands of people lose their jobs. Lives are ruined based on something that never existed. So any document from my birth certificate to the 19th Amendment to this list of McCarthy's has to be made to work. They don't do these things on themselves. They have to be made to work. And sometimes they do different work at different points in their lifestyle. Here's one of the great document stories of all time. You all know this. You've all seen this. Many of you have seen it in person in the British Museum. It's the most visited object in the British Museum. It's the most famous, the most lucrative, the most marketed object in the British Museum. It's the Rosetta Stone. And as you may already tell, I, I haven't picked the obvious things here when I was um, doing a podcast series and then putting this book together. You know, what am I going to say about Magna Carta that somebody hasn't already said? But the Rosetta, and I didn't want to do the Rosetta Stone until I went to the London, uh, until I went to London a few years ago and saw the Rosetta Stone again. And the docent said, you know, everybody knows there's three languages on this, and this is how we broke the code of hieroglyphics, and Champollion used this to figure out the Egyptian language and all the rest of it, blah, 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 blah. But what I never knew, and what very few people know, and you can't really see it from this image, is uh, there are four languages on this. And up the side, up one side and down the other is written, presented by the British to the British Museum by King George the um, Third in English, uh, because when the when the uh, English stole this from the French who dug it up in the in the Egyptian desert during the Napoleonic campaigns, they effectively vandalized it. But now it's historical record. So now there's four languages on this, and that made me think this thing is really interesting. So this was meant originally. Everybody knows this thing, but nobody knows what it is. Well, it's the text of what's known as the Decree of Memphis. Ptolemy VII is a boy king um, in the second century BCE whose father is killed by, you know, thugs and mercenaries led by his father's mistress. Well, we've all been there, right? We know these things. And um, you're the boy king now, and the priests come to you and say, hey, why don't you, uh, we're going to make you a god, and we're going to celebrate your birthday in the official calendar, and we're going to support you on the throne. And in return, we want you to free some political prisoners after we, you know, purge the assassins um, who we probably put up to do it in the first place. Um, and you're going you're gonna, to uh, authorize our legitimacy, and, and, and that's a good idea, right? And Ptolemy, not being stupid, says yes. This is the decree that legitimizes all of that. There are multiple examples of this that are known. We've, uh, more have been uncovered. It's partial. There should be a whole lot more up at the top and at the bottom. But this thing was carved, not always well. There's spelling errors in the Greek, which means that either the carvers were illiterate or they didn't have whiteout in those days. Um, propped up against temples, and it, it effectively stabilized the regime. Ptolemy dies, the dynasty dies, um, the, you know, the, the, the empire falls, and, and years later, we don't know quite how, this thing is taken down and used eventually as foundation material for a fort in Rashid, which the French interpreted as Rosetta, hence the Rosetta Stone. So I, I used this example once in a class I taught here at the University of Washington a few years ago, and I, I explained this to a group of freshmen. I said, well, first it's a rock and then it's floated down the Nile, and then it's carved, and then it's propped up against 
um, the uh, temple. So is it is it a document then? Is it information? And they said, yes, 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 of course. And I said, okay. Well, now it's in the British Museum and it's used to you know help understand the history of how we understood the Egyptian culture. Is it a document now? And they said, yes. And I said, well, what about when it was buried for a thousand years? It still had the squiggles on it, even though nobody was seeing the squiggles. Not very many people understood the squiggles. Was it a document for a thousand years when it was buried in the desert? And one young woman said, no. And I said, well, why not? What made it different? And she said, well, it has to try. <laughs> Which I thought was one of the best examples of what makes something informational, situational, et cetera, situational relevance. That was pretty good. So it has to try. And for a long time, it didn't try. And now it's trying. But now it's trying and doing very different work from what it originally was meant to do. And the longer the story of these things, the more of these kind of twists and turns they can take. Um, I wanted to spend some time with, with things that this audience might be familiar with, things about how knowledge is created and, and, and shared, um, and particular things that are um, familiar to many of us. There's Noah Webster, and if you're not following the Merriam-Webster Dictionary Twitter feed, you are missing out. You should follow this, because you get a word of the day, but also they're just kind of snarky. Um, and you find out what words are trending and why and what other dreadful things are happening in the world. Um, the, the dictionary itself, the Merriam-Webster dictionary, the Webster's dictionary itself is, is interesting for a couple of reasons. It's the last dictionary for, that we, of any substance that was written by a single person. He did it all. Okay, mind you, he stole a third of the entries from Samuel Johnson, but that's what lexicographers do. So that's, that's not, there's nothing new there. Um, but what he primarily was trying to do, note the title, an American dictionary of the English language. He was trying to articulate what American English was as distinct from British English. And so what you see over here on the right is from the edition section. So these were the last words to make it in. And if you look, for example, at dishonor at the very top of the right-hand side, uh, there's no U in that. Emphasize further down is a Z rather than an S. Um, Webster was also interested in spelling reform, as was Melville Dewey. Webster was rather better at it. He didn't get everything he wanted. He, he, he wanted women to be spelled W-I-M-M-E-N. That didn't fly. Um, uh, but he did manage to get the Z and, and drop the O. Blebby, by the way, if you're looking at Blebby right under bookstore over there on the left, um, blebby, a bleb is a blister. That one hasn't really taken off. Uh, but you see, it's a, it's a fairly rudimentary dictionary, but it's got usage notes and, and uh, etymology and so on. Um, but this tells, us some, this, this tells us about the power of this to articulate not only spelling, but also usage and the way people um, think about language, and particularly the way American, uh, this was a very nationalistic thing. Um, this is a very internationalistic thing. This is the Internet Protocol. Uh, which is uh, actually written as an RFC. It's, a, it's, for all intents and purposes, a print document. If you've got good resolution, you can see this was done on a dot matrix printer. Uh, there's something really funny about the fact that the Internet is, the protocol, Internet protocols to this very day are controlled by something that is effectively ASCII art. Um, everybody knows the Wikipedia story. The Newpedia story is a little bit less known. This is what Jimmy Wales and Larry Sanger did before the Wikipedia. They wanted to build, this is 2000, um, actually they started in 1999, they wanted to build a, a peer-reviewed encyclopedia of really high quality for the internet, and they did it. And the Newpedia was, you know, had very high standards, and, and it took a lot of process to get articles in, and nobody used it. And they had this great idea, let's, let's build a wiki and put it as a front end, as a sort of a, you know, hopper for people to write articles and refine them before they go in the Newpedia. And we all know what happened after that. So the unintended consequence here is that the Wikipedia turned out to be way more interesting than the Newpedia. But also this, this is a very 21st century idea about where authority comes from. Britannica and its, and its it's kin, the other encyclopedias that we all are familiar with, are top down, and this is bottom up. And neither one is necessarily any better, but they are very different ways of um, instantiating and constructing knowledge. 
Um, here's another kind of bottom-up way of constructing knowledge. This is probably familiar to lots of you. This is the cholera map that Jon Snow, not the Game of Thrones Jon Snow, but Jon Snow, the physician, um, constructs. This is during the cholera epidemic in Soho in London in 1854. You see the, the black marks there. Those are the spots where people died in this cholera outbreak. And it was all based on which pump handle you used. If you went to one water pump that was contaminated, you basically died. If you went to the other one, you lived. And he used a whole variety of um, sources of data, statistical data, interviewing people, um, graphical methods, uh, mapping methods like this. So this not only is the beginnings of what we think of today as public health or epidemi epidemiology, because before this people thought cholera was caused by bad air. It's also very early prototypical GIS. It's data science, it's visualization, it's a whole bunch of things that begin to lead us to the way we're, we're comfortable now in thinking about how knowledge is constructed, how science is constructed and, and done. Uh, there is the first scholarly journal, The Philosophical Transactions, published by the Royal Society in 1665 and continually published ever since. Um, there's now the uh, philosophical Transactions A and B. Um, the earliest volumes of this are fascinating. Newton wrote an article about optics. The Great Comet of 1665 is described here. Um, you can almost feel, if you read the first volume of it, they're sort of working out what, um, what a scholarly journal is and ought to be. Um, the first volume has an index at the end, which I think they made up. Um, there's letters to the editor in the second issue. And many of the features, if you read the Philosophical Transactions, it doesn't actually read like a scholarly journal today, but it isn't all that different. So here's a form that we're all familiar with. Some of you use every day of your lives or, you know, arm wrestle with vendors over or whatever. And it's, it's not all that different than it was 350 years ago. And we also all know that the scholarly communication regime is undergoing profound change. Um, and and there, what is the next milestone? What is the next philosophical transactions that we will look back at in 50 years and say, this is where the next generation of scholarly communication started? It's entirely possible it's already happened. Um, this is just a great example. Um, this, that's uh, the Reverend James Usher, and this is the Annals of the World, and he told us when the world was created. And if you look at the first paragraph there, it's the 23rd day of October, 4004 BCE. And it was the evening of the 23rd of October. Um, he used scripture and secular texts to calculate the exact moment of creation. Um, about a third of the American population believes that 4004 BCE is the, is the date of creation, that the earth, that the earth is 6,000 years old. Um, and uh, James Usher has a, a lot to answer for that, although what I will also say is um, this, uh, Newton calculated the date of creation and came up with 4000 BCE, and uh, Usher used the best tools that he had and the best techniques that he had. So in 1650, that's the best we have. Today we believe the universe is 13 and a half billion years old until something better comes along. Um, that's a face you were probably not familiar with, nor a work you were probably familiar with, but it affects many of the objects that are in our institutions and collections. That's Sir Ronald Fisher, uh, one of the early articulators of what we now think of as statistical methods, quantitative methods, and in particular, inferential statistical methods. He wrote a book called Statistical Methods for Research Workers in 1925. Not really a textbook, more of a sort of compilation of practice at the time. Um, and in there, on page, I think that's page 67, at the very bottom there, I know many of you aren't familiar with this, but I'll, I'll lead you through this. He throws in this little sentence. We shall not often be astray if we draw a conventional line at 0.05 and consider that higher values of chi-square, he's talking about the chi-square test here, indicate a real discrepancy. And that's the first articulation of what we think of today as statistical significance. So all those journal articles, all those research studies, all those um, you know, findings that say they're statistically significant, it's because they cross that threshold that he just kind of made up. You know, somebody had to pick a line, he picked a line, it got accepted, there's nothing you know, sinister about this, but that's where it all started. And now, almost 100 years on, 
that's still how it goes. Um, here's a great story. So, uh, uh, you know, today's September 21st, but it's September 21st because the Pope said so. Uh, that's Pope Gregory VII sitting on his throne. Notice the guy pointing at Scorpio. Um, in 1582, everybody knew that the calendar was out of whack, but they didn't know how to fix it. Um, and the Pope convenes a commission that uh, figures out how to fix it. They actually do figure out a way to fix it. This is the Gregorian cal calendar we use today. But it takes several hundred years for this papal bull, Inter Gravissimus, that the Pope writes and seals. It takes several hundred years for this to make its way around the earth. Italy adopts it almost immediately, of course, as does Spain and France. But, uh, oops, sorry, we're back on Sir Ronald. Um, but it takes more than 100 years, almost 150 years, for this to reach Germany and England, um, even later um, to places like Russia and China. The Islamic calendar is still lunar rather than solar. And the reason this took so long to get around is in no small part because of this. That's an indulgence. And you all know what an indulgence is. It's, you can see that it's basically a form. It's mostly printed. This is a printed indulgence. And you see that there's handwriting there. So it's a boilerplate form that people have filled in, which is fine. Um, what you may not know about this is that this is the first printed document using movable type in Western Europe. That is 1454. This is what Gutenberg printed to keep the doors open while he's working on the Bible. The Bible is 1455. It takes him three years to print the Bible because it's such an undertaking. And to keep money flowing, he begins to print indulgences, also school books and other things. But this is the first uh, printed document in Europe to bear a date. And this, in no small part, um, increases the popularity of indulgences, which become not only a way to get your loved ones out of purgatory, but also to raise money for the church. Um, it leads to Luther, it leads to the Reformation, and it leads to why it takes the Pope, why it takes the Gregorian calendar hundreds of years to make its way through Protestant Europe, because Germans were not interested in having the Pope scrape 11 days out of their lives, which is effectively what happened, um, because they didn't trust the Pope. And as a result, it there are multiple calendars are running simultaneously throughout the world. Um, for a very long time. And it also raises the question, if something was wrong with the calendar today, could any single person do anything about that with the stroke of a pen? It seems highly unlikely. So this was about the last period, 1582 was the uh, intergravissimus, about the last period in which a single person could affect change around the world just with a stroke of a pen. It just isn't that kind of world anymore. These two, uh, these two documents, Intergravissimus and the Indulgence, also demonstrate the role of faith and belief. Um, many, of these, uh, many of these documents are not only work because people believe in them, but they are also the products of faith. Um, not all of those are positive. I'm not going to linger on the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, but I will say, even though this has been debunked for the better part of a century, it is still available uh, not only to buy on Amazon, but also freely available on the Internet. Um, and you can't prove your way out of a conspiracy. Uh, people believe this, but every piece of evidence you put forward to, to, to knock this thing down is only seen as evidence that the conspiracy is fighting back. Here's a far more... Um, uh, agreeable uh, demonstration of the nexus of power and faith. Um, what you see here is a votive disc of the high priestess in Hejuana at worship. Uh, in Hejuana was a high priestess in the Sumerian city-state of Ur uh, in, the in the 24th century BCE. Her father was the emperor Sargon. Um, we know in Hejuana's name because she wrote, and in particular because she wrote hymns to her goddess, one of which is the exaltation of Inanna. And in that hymn, she names herself. She uses the first person in talking about the writing and even the gestation of the hymn, which is how we know her name. She's one of the first women whose names we know, and she is the first earliest known author. So the idea of authorship, of taking credit for your work, may well have begun with the high priestess in Hejuana uh, 4,300 years ago, which is a quite remarkable thing when you think about it. 
power manifests in a lot of ways. We've seen power in the constitutional amendment, in the birth certificate, in the will, in the riot act, even in McCarthy, but also in Webster, in the TCPIP protocols, in the Newpedia, in the indulgence. Here's another example of power. This is the DSM. That's the first edition of the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. This, is, this lists all the mental disorders. And if, you're not, if your syndrome isn't in there, you don't have a mental disorder and you can't get insurance to have it treated. So, if you're, so this is a tremendously powerful work. Here, the authority comes from expertise and experience, but if you're not in the book, it's not a mental illness. This is a fascinating example that I want to explore more. Uh, this is an ancient practice called the Damnatio Memoriae, and, and this is on my mind also because of events of the last few weeks and months. Um, it was not an unusual practice, particularly in Rome, but this also took place in Egypt and other places around the world, for a new emperor to deface, literally deface, images of his predecessors. So what you see here is two coins. This is um, uh, Nero. Uh, one has been defaced, um, uh, and that was so that to try to remove someone from memory. That's what Demnatio Memoriae means, is to remove someone from memory. So we have lots of examples of defaced coins, of statues, missing faces, and, sub, and, and, many things, and other examples, as I say, both in Rome and in Egypt. Um, the recent discussion about how we remember events around the Civil War, for example, around memorials and statues and monuments and so on, uh, brought to mind to me the, the very old idea, this is not a new idea, uh, of the Donatio Memoriae. If, if any of these ever actually worked, of course, we don't know it because they would have literally removed someone from history. In a way, you can also think of these as the opposite of the golden records, meant to sort of preserve everything. Um, these were meant to destroy everything. Um, there's other examples of power, and power doesn't always work in the ways that people think and always in the way that people intend it. This is, that's one of several original rough, rough drafts of the Declaration of Independence. That's in Jefferson's original hand from 1776, and you can see it's a rough draft because he, he crosses stuff out and writes stuff in, and there's a little box there at the bottom. A second page of this also has a little flap that he pasted over it to to uh, sort of substitute. This is long before uh, uh, word processing, obviously. Um, so as I said earlier, what am I going to say about the Declaration of Independence that hasn't already been said? But uh, uh, the more interesting story, or a more interesting story of the Declaration of Independence is the passage that was struck out that is known today as the He Has Waged Cruel War passage. And it was the passage that condemned the slave trade. It was removed. Uh, it, during the editing process, the fairly extensive editing process and amending process that went on in the Constitutional, in the, in the Continental Congress in June and July of 1776. There is no record of who moved it to be deleted or how that vote went. Uh, there's very little discussion in the Congressional Journal about the editing and amending and adoption process of the Declaration of Independence. But it was struck. Most people believe if it wasn't struck, the Declaration would never have been approved. Bear in mind, the idea of, of independence had already been approved. The Declaration was just the statement of it. And it happened two days later. The, the resolution on independence had already been passed. This was just the statement about it. But many people say if the he has waged cruel war passage wasn't deleted, the Declaration would never have been approved. But it was, and it was, and we're still dealing with the outflow from the striking of that passage 240 years later. So never let it be said that the editing process isn't important. Uh, power. Well, here's a cute example of power. There's Franklin Roosevelt carving a turkey. Um, the date of Thanksgiving may seem a really settled question now. Uh, for a long time, it wasn't. It was individually proclaimed by presidents going all the way back to Washington. Um, it wasn't always a Thursday. It wasn't always in November. Lincoln sort of fixed it as the fifth, as the fourth Thursday in, uh, or the last Thursday in November. Roosevelt takes office in 33, and people write to him saying, oh, Thanksgiving is going to come really late this year. This is the very depths of the Depression. Why don't you move it back by a week? and then we'll have a longer shopping season, 1933. Uh, Roosevelt doesn't do it, but in 39 he does. 
because we're in the same calendar position. So he moves it around. Those of you who know the movie Holiday Inn, there's that little animated thing of the turkey going back and forth. That's a reference to this. Um, the Senate didn't like that. The Congress didn't like this, so they passed a law fixing the date of Thanksgiving. Note the date on this thing. This is two days after Pearl Harbor, and the Senate is using its time to pick the date of Thanksgiving, but there it is. Uh, but for a couple of years, there were multiple dates of Thanksgiving. This is a map from Newsweek. List, so find your state, and then if you were if you have the little pilgrim carrying a turkey, then you would celebrate on the 23rd. If you have the little pilgrim eating the turkey, you celebrate it on the 30th. And you see different states at different ones, you know. Uh, uh, this went on for a couple of years until um, until the Congress acted. So this is a kind of cute example of the, the, the power of the proclamation. This is a proclamation the presidents used to give. It's not enumerated in the Constitution as a presidential power, but it's been used all the way back since, um, uh, since Washington for proclamations, usually for kind of ceremonial stuff. Um, the other version of this is something called the executive order. Um, these can be far less cute. Um, and this is a poster that was posted in Seattle. This is the Seattle version of it, um, telling people where to report and when to be deported uh, as a result of Executive Order 9066. This is an executive order different from a proclamation. Um, these have been ruled to be constitutional because they fall into this kind of what the Congressional Research Service calls a twilight zone of presidential power. Um, uh, so the executive orders, this is how ex executive orders have been ruled that they are constitutional, even though they are not enumerated by the Constitution. Um, and they can sometimes have devastating impacts. Um, and in this, and in many cases, impacts that go on uh, for generations, if not longer. Well, we're talking about presidents. Um, here's a fascinating document. This is frame 312 of the Zapruder film. Abraham Zapruder was a dressmaker in Dallas who left his movie camera at home that morning. And it was only when the skies cleared about 10.30 that he went home to get it. So imagine, if you will, a world without the Zapruder film. Uh, yet another conspiracy, yet another set of questions. This is frame 312. Frame 313 is the impact. Uh, I'll spare you frame 313, but you can certainly find it. Um, I include this not only because the Zapruder story itself is fascinating, not to mention the story of this film, which was seized by the government um, as a presidential assassination record under eminent domain. Uh, the family was paid off, but they kept the copyright. There's a lot of stories behind the Zapruder film. What I want to use it for here is to, is to plant a, a question in your mind for the rest of the day. Watch yourself the rest of the day and watch all the different ways in which what you do can be recorded or documented. When you make a purchase, when you send an email, when you can be seen by a video camera, when your cell phone is tracking your movements um, as you drive using a, a ma mapping app or call an Uber. In 1963, when the Zapruder film was taken, it's unusual, it is rare um, to be recorded, to be documented, to be um, uh, verified or validated. Today, it's almost ubiquitous. And that's a different kind of world. So the Zapruder film is one of the first instances of cameras everywhere. Um, and just imagine yourself today and all the different ways that you're being recorded and documented. And think about it, what, what it means to live in a world like that and how that world is going to be different and how we're going to live in that world and how we as information professionals are going to help people live in that world and what that's going to mean for our institutions and collections. So I can't end on something that grim. I'm going to end on something far more fun and interesting, which is the Fanny Farmer cookbook. That is Fanny Farmer on the left, looking somewhat disapprovingly, I think, of her, uh, of her student. And she's holding a measuring cup. And she's holding a measuring cup because she is known as the mother of level measurements. Fanny Farmer, that's the Fanny Farmer cookbook. Uh, the Boston Cooking School cookbook written by Fanny Merritt Farmer, first edition, 1896. She's the first person to write recipes in the way we think of them today, kind of structured with rules and with level measurements. There are several pages in this book that talk about how to measure flour, how to measure water, how to, how to do it so that it would be standardized and precise. 
she's also known as one of the first people to first cookbook writers to actually enjoy eating. Uh, <laughs> they were all pretty dull and pretty pretty rudimentary. Um, and that uh, uh, book that you see on the right is mine. That was my grandmother's. Uh, as there was a present to her from her father on her uh, on, on on her 16th Christmas. Um, and I still have it. It's actually sitting here next to me on my desk. Um, and so I want to bring it back to the personal. Um, all of these documents that we've talked about, the grand and exalted and the evil and the unknown and the, the hidden and the layered and the interesting and the personal, are all milestones of human activity, good, bad, and otherwise. And they always will be. These are things that help us to remember, that help us to function, that help us to do work. Uh, and the stories they tell are not only about themselves and about us as individuals, but us as a society and a culture. Um, and as such, um, they're just fascinating ways of thinking about who we are and where we've been and, in some cases, where we're going. Um, so, um, as I said, I'm nothing if not a storyteller. You just had a whole bunch of stories. If these are interesting to you, there are many more stories and many more to each of those stories. Um, in the book that, uh, that was published a few months ago, which is, uh, uh, as Mark said, available through the publisher's website and also on Amazon. Um, and there's also a podcast series. Just search for my name and the word documents um, on iTunes and other podcasting hubs, and you can hear me rattle on even more about these documents and others. Um, thank you all very much. Thank you for attending. I hope this was interesting, um, and I'm delighted. We've got a few minutes left. I'd be delighted to um, uh, answer any questions. Great. <clears throat> Excuse me. Great. This is Mark uh, with ACRLN Choice. Thank you so much, Joe, for uh, walking through all these documents. We get a few questions coming in here, it looks like. Great. Um, I would encourage folks to keep them coming. We've got a few minutes here. Um, we've got a question, it looks like, that just came in from Jennifer. And Jennifer says, um, can we count on LC, which I assume is the Library of Congress, yeah. to have everything published in the U.S.? She says it's not their mandate. If not, then do we need to keep everything, and who's responsible for collecting it and, and that sort of thing? Do you have any thoughts on that, Joe? Uh, well, the, uh, one of the things that I didn't talk about are the documents that we don't know because they didn't survive. The Exaltation of Inanna survived because it worked. That hymn um, was successful, and we have manuscripts, it's all in cuneiform on clay tablets, we have manuscript examples, dozens of manuscript examples, handwritten examples of the Exaltation of Inanna over five centuries. So that was popular and used, and lots of copies were made, and as a result, it survived. But lots of writing from that period, not to mention Egypt and Rome and Greece, and you know there might even be lost Shakespeare plays, and they just destroyed the hard drive from Terry Pratchett, which I was just devastated by because he's my favorite author, and Terry Pratchett's hard drive, he just, just steamrolled based on his, um, his last wishes. Uh, there's lots of stuff that didn't survive, and that's why we have archives. That's why Ashurbanipal in the 8th century BCE built an archive to save the records of his empire. That's why Alexandria was built. That's why the British Library was built. That's why the first Chinese emperor tried to destroy all the works that came before him so that those traces of those civilizations would be gone. That's why the Damnatio Memoriae is tried. That's why we have institutions meant to preserve these things so that they will survive and so that we will survive. There are a way that we can all live on and, and be remembered and be understood. And I think that's one of the most um, uh, central aspects of what it means to be human. So, yeah, you know, I, I mean, LC is a depository library for copyright, but that doesn't exactly work the way that it used to. And, and the, the more of these artifacts, and particularly artifacts that are fugitive in nature or ephemeral in nature or natively digital and don't necessarily have any kind of fixed, tangible, real-world presence, the, the importance of preserving those just gets more important by the day. Hmm. Very, very interesting, yeah. Um, we've got a question that came through the chat um, from Lucy, and Lucy asks, what type of sources did you use to research these, these topics? <laughs> Did they, I you want the dirty secret, huh? <laughs> Well, here's the dirty little secret is, um, in most cases, I started with Wikipedia. Uh, 
sorry. Um, you know, we all know Wikipedia is bad because they're being edited, blah, blah, blah. Um, I did what I think many people do is I, I use Wikipedia as an orientation tool. I use Google as an orientation tool. Many of these things, I knew the basic story. I mean, we all know the Rosetta Stone story. We all know the Declaration of Independence story. We all know a lot of these. Um, but I used the um, Wikipedia as a as an orientation thing and as sources. I, I will say, I, I noticed that Betsy Wilson was one of the attendees. I hope she's still listening. Um, I, I am tremendously fortunate to be at the University of Washington, and we have one of the great library collections in North America, one of the great library collections in the world. And I have been through every stack. I think I've been through every Library of, call, library of Congress call number range um, in investigating this stuff. And, and a good deal of what I did was reading original stuff. So I read the Declaration of Independence. I read the Rosetta Stone text. I listened to the 18 and a half minute gap in the tape. I read the philosophical transaction. Um, I used Hadi Trust a lot too, particularly for the older stuff. Um, I, I, I tried to get as much of the real story and the, the secondary stories as I could. And, and the, one, the episodes that I did and the chapters I wrote in the book are the ones that I found that there were more than one layer to the story. Um, there are a lot of things I began to investigate that I kind of lost interest in because they just, you know, there wasn't a sort of second piece to it. But when I discovered the, um, you know, the Alfred Nobel will story that the will was so badly constructed it should never have been, um, uh, never should, should never have worked. Wow, that's fascinating. Um, and that the riot act had to be read out loud and that the stock market ticker tape, which I didn't even get to, um, uh, you know, helped to propel the fear because it fell behind and prices were falling and people didn't know it. Um, those kinds of things. Those are just fascinating stories. And the more I read, the more fascinating they got. So, um, so yes, I started with Wikipedia, um, but then I used a lot of books and, and journal articles and original materials as best I could. And, and fortunately, I was able to get a lot of that stuff because uh, our university does such a great job. So thank you, Betsy. Um, and thank you to the University of Washington and all the other places that supplied interlibrary loan stuff. I really appreciate it. All right, so we've got a few more questions here. Um, let's see. Uh, the most recent one I think that we've got is from Pat, and Pat asks, are Twitter messages documents? Should we preserve them? Uh, well, the answer to the first one is certainly yes. Um, about preserving them, there's a, I mean, there was that whole business a few years ago that Library of Congress said they were going to preserve all the tweets and then they figured out they didn't know how to do it and they didn't have the storage capacity and they didn't have the metadata capacity and that was just kind of embarrassing. Um, tweets are preserved. Now they're preserved by Twitter. Even if you delete it, they're preserved by Twitter. Um, and if you really want a, your hair to stand on end, go to the Twitter website and, and first of all, look at the search facility, the advanced search facility for Twitter. There's a lot of stuff going on there. There's a lot of ways you can search for tweets. And second of all, look at the metadata. For something that can only be 140 characters, there's two or three pages of metadata um, involved in tweets. So they are all saved uh, by Twitter, um, but not necessarily in any, and you can search them, but you can't retrieve deleted ones and you can't always see all the metadata. So here's an example of something that is profoundly powerful, um, particularly in the last few months, um, that, it, that has profound power, but is not, freely available, it feels freely available, and it seems it is, but of course it's owned by a corporate entity. Um, and that corporate entity has its own interests at heart, and they want to make money, which is increasingly a struggle for Twitter in particular. Um, but like any company, they need to maximize revenue, and they need ways to monetize this. And so those things are there, but they're, and they're available, but not really, and they're kind of free, but they're not. And uh, this is increasingly going to be the case. Um, not only with, you know, content, if you think about YouTube videos, if you think about Facebook postings, if you think about pictures on Instagram, that's content that we create and then we sort of think we own, but we all kind of know that we don't own. But also, you know, the, the metadata and the analytics and all the other stuff. So while you're watching yourself being observed today, think about Facebook, think about Twitter, think about Instagram, think about all the social media stuff you do, and they're watching you too, and your Google search history and your email, and yeah, um, and if you don't wind up living, off, living in a cave by the end of the day, you're welcome. Great, great. So um, we're coming up on the end of our time here. Um, we've got 
certainly other questions that um, I'm afraid we don't really have time to get to. Um, so I'll just say thank you, Joe, so much for, for doing this. Um, and thanks to each of you out there in the audience for spending some time with us today. Um, it's been really interesting learning about all of these different documents from all over the world. Um, I would just mention that uh, we do have a link in the chat box there for a survey that um, you can take to let us know how we did. I would appreciate it if you took a few minutes uh, here at the end of the webinar to, to rate it and just to give us some feedback. That's always very important. Um, and I would mention, too, that um, Joe is, is talking about his podcast here. We do have another conversation with Joe um, that will be coming out in the Choice podcast, which is available on our website at choice360.org. Um, and starting October 2nd, you'll have four weeks of uh, extended conversation about um, some other documents uh, with Joe. So I'd encourage you to check that out. So uh, the last thing is just to remind you that we did record the webinar today and that everyone that um, signed up for it should be on the lookout for a follow-up email from ACRL and Choice with a link to the recording. So thanks to all of you out there for joining us. Hope you enjoyed the session, and I hope you have uh, a great rest of the day. Thanks so much. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>